in this lecture i will cover uh, diffraction at various length scale i will introduce you to it and in the following lectures i will discuss in details various important techniques under diffraction and i will also uh, introduce you to the fact that the diffraction experiment is done in reactors and in spallation neutron sources or pulse neutron sources in two different ways and i will introduce you to both of these techniques uh, in reasonable details now going to the fact that we can do diffraction at various length scale what i mean is that uh, mostly we are introduced to diffraction either in light where we talk about diffraction as the bending of beams at an edge or we talk about diffraction to find out crystallographic structures but actually diffraction is an elastic experiment where you determine structure at various length scales in various q ranges because they are the conjugate of each other so with this is starting let me tell you i had shown this slide to you earlier again i am bring it to your notice that studies with neutrons in condensed matter can give us structure and dynamics as we said in case of structure we measure intensity versus angle or we will translate it to intensity as a function of q because for structure we are not bothered about energy transfer and q is given by 4 pi by lambda sin theta which is the angle in this slide and we measure intensity as a function of q from where we go back to gr which is a general correlation function in condensed matter so that means in diffraction we cover a wide range of length scales so for example for crystal structure we work at angstrom and sub angstrom level and for uh, liquid and amorphous systems uh, we can go up to uh, fractions of an angstrom because in liquid and amorphous systems we have uh, local structures but no long range order then at mesoscopic length scale we can study inhomogeneities typically 10 to 100 angstrom like micelles precipitates in metals or even pores in stones at 10000 angstrom and also under the same category of studies we have thin films where we can understand layered structures that means their thickness interface roughness through reflectometry reflectometry can be done using neutrons and x rays both but importantly because neutrons are sensitive to magnetic moment for all these techniques which i mentioned here all the techniques that i mentioned here an overlying feature is the magnetic scattering of neutrons the other half is about measurement of intensity as a function of energy and angle both so there like for structure i said range of structures in case of dynamics we can what time scale of dynamics so we can study phonons we can study rotational diffusions or you can even study slower dynamics at nanometer nano nanosecond time scale of relaxation of polymer backbone these experiments per se are more difficult than the experiments where we do structures because here we have to analyze the energy of the scattered beam and then the question will come at what q range and in what e range so the length scale of dynamics and energy scale of dynamics length scale is given by q and energy gives us the time scale of the dynamics if i don't have e resolution then q range gives us the length scale of the structure that we are trying to study so now in this half of my talk i will be in general addressing the elastic scattering that means no energy analysis and as i told earlier that in a reactor the incident beam 
is collimated as well as made a monochromatic beam using monochromators or velocity selectors and we define the energy and direction direction is nothing but given by k it's a k vector which is magnitude wise 2 pi by lambda and then the scattered beam goes in this two dimension it looks a circle but actually it will go on a sphere and then we can use detectors usually detectors and inside the shielding weigh well above one ton so it is difficult to cover the entire 4 pi with detectors in a reactor in a monochromatic beam usually we will be in a planar geometry where either you have the end on detectors taking data serially angle by angle which was done earlier or today we have got position sensitive detector where the neutron detector at a certain position gives the direction of the neutron scattering because knowing the distance from the sample from the sample to the detector and knowing the resolution of the detector we can tell it exact what is the position and what is the position resolution in the experimental setup so with this typically this is a powder diffractometer at Dhruva I just show you the outside of the detector bank so here as I showed that there is a sample from which the neutron beam is scattered goes in various directions and we have position sensitive detectors the bank that I showed you so here if the distance is d and the position resolution is delta l and then one is that knowing the position average position this if this distance is d then from the distance the channel number i can see that channel number by d will give you idea of theta and the delta l by d will give you the resolution in wave in the delta theta of the setup so this is the detector bank you can see it from the back side of the detector bank the monochromator drum is here at the center of which there is a monochromatizing crystal the sample position we can't see it is over somewhere over here below and then you have this detector bank and this is the counting electronics as well as data collection software so this is a Druva I just want to show you typical data this is how it looks like after Ridveld analysis so I have to introduce you to Ridveld analysis for data specifically I will be deal with crystallography together with magnetic crystallography because neutron is extremely important not only for finding out crystallography structure but also to determine the magnetic structure actually that is the strength of neutrons because crystallography structure can be easily detected by x-rays x-rays till now by far the most important tool to find out structure of materials except for the fact that if our materials have low z elements like you can see oxygen over here x-rays are insensitive to low z material and that's why whenever my structure has got low z materials neutron is a better choice but more importantly if it is a magnetic structure for example iron ferromagnetic iron nickel cobalt or their compounds like nickel zinc fe2o4 so these structures and their magnetic structures are sometimes commensurate sometimes incommensurate and neutron is possibly the only tool to determine the structure of it here the data you see this is as per angle versus intensity fitted and the data is from Dhruva so this is a typical data and you can see the how the fit looks like and from here we can uh, uh, at least in this ca case of this sample magnetic structure was determined
Now, this is the photograph I have given the source here of the one of the most popular and possibly most used uh, diffractometers at the reactor in ILL Grenoble. You can see the similarity with the previous photograph. This is at Druva. This is at uh, ILL Grenoble. Here also we have a position sensitive detector bank. The beam comes onto the sample at the center of the sample table and uh, of course in this case we have much higher resolution, much better intensity but typical structures are very similar in reactors where usually you have a sample position surrounded by position sensitive detectors and things like resolution here intensity because I, if you may not remember I showed you that there is a vertical detector bank for this particular there is a detector bank which is vertically focused so this is vertical not horizontal so you have detectors vertically focused detectors raising the intensity at the sample position being vertically focused and each each face has got a detector number of detectors strips so this is vertical and it is bent like this in the vertical direction it is bent actually it is bent like this as I showed you and horizontally also it gives a large beam by bending the crystal in that direction so these are the ways one can enhance intensity and make a compromise between intensity and resolution in various spectrometers but in general the powder diffractometers in most of the reactor sources look like this as I showed you, they look like this and uh, then let us go to how it, be, it will be in a spallation neutron source. In a spallation neutron source, uh, we have a polychromatic beam and we measure a time of flight. How do we measure time of flight? So primarily there is a proton beam which comes and hits a target hits a target which can be uranium or in a high z material like tantalum now when it hits a target we start a clock we start the clock it's like starting a stopwatch the neutron goes actually neutron does not go directly this is wrong let me correct myself from the dump it goes to a moderator moderator it gets moderated then it goes to the sample and gets scattered and once it comes to the detector I stop the clock so start to stop I measure the time of flight this will be typically as I uh, I don't know whether I mentioned it will be typically around say uh, 4 angstrom neutron 4 angstrom neutron it covers something like 1000 meters per microsecond so you can imagine if it is 1 angstrom neutron it will be covering around 4000 meters per microsecond these length scales are typically tens of meters it can vary depending on the resolution that you demand from your system so it is easy to measure the time of flight in these polychromatic pulse beams if we want to do a similar experiment in a reactor then I have to chop the beam if I chop the beam I throw away a lot of neutrons and certainly I can do time of flight spectroscopy in a reactor but at the cost of lots of neutrons Whereas in case of spallation neutron sources, because it is typically a pulse source, the source is suitable for time of flight spectroscopy. For example, the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in uh, RL, they have got a 50 hertz source, 50 hertz source. That means 50 pulses per second. That means there are 20 millisecond between the pulses so I can count neutrons pulse by pulse one 
first pulse start the clock neutron detected stop second pulse start the clock neutron reaches detector stop the pulse so that is how pulse by pulse we can do the spectroscopy so in this case 2d sin theta equal to lambda now i will quantify it 2d sin theta equal to lambda is the bragg law but in we know lambda is equal to h by mv for a neutron or for any particle is the broglie wavelength and v for a particular wavelength of neutron is given by v is equal to l by t which is the time of flight so 2d sin theta will be equal to h by m l by t this is the bragg's law for a pulse source for a particular time of flight in a polychromatic beam so now in case of pulse sources we don't try to monochromatize the source we choose neutrons in a pulse but of course we cannot take all the neutrons so there is something called choppers combination of choppers will which will allow a certain range of wavelength for our application and after that we do time of flight spectroscopy using this formula so now my resolution in case of bragg's law for a monochromatic beam with a mosaic spread reads like delta d by d square is one is the wavelength resolution other part is the angle resolution here by using this formula i get delta d by d square depends on delta t by t the time of flight resolution delta l by l the time of flight resolution because time of flight will have some uncertainties like detector thickness and the angular resolution so both of all three of these can be improved if we use a detector bank at far away because if l is large then for a given delta l for any kind of length determination delta l by l will be fractionally small similarly for a large t my delta t by t will be small if i go farther away because farther length larger t longer l longer the l longer is t and delta t be smaller and similarly if i use a detector bank if i use a detector bank if i use a detector bank with detectors like matrix matrices like this matrices like this if the dis if i consider the neutron detected in a in one of these strips has got some delta x delta y that angular resolution goes as delta x by l and larger the l given the size of a detector the angular resolution will be better delta theta will be better and then large angle it will be even better so larger flight path la gives larger time and a detector bank with with matrices of detectors with better angular resolution and for that and in back scattering geometry cot theta is the best actually nearly zero at 180 degree it's equal to zero so in back scattering geometry at a large distance with a long flight time we get the best resolution and this is so a long flight path and the large flight time at large angle will give the best resolution and delta theta can be decreased as i told you using strip detectors usually in most of the detectors most of the experiments the primary flight path is the source to sample l1 and secondary flight path is sample to the detector l2 l1 plus l2 dictates the l usually l1 is kept long and l2 is few meters except for the cases when we want to have very high resolution so i just show you the schematic of uh, one of the best powder diffractometers in rutherford appleton laboratory i have given the source here so 
This is called HRPD, High Resolution Powder Diffractometer, NSAR tool, and shown here. So there are detectors at shorter distances, but the high resolution detector bank is nearly 90 meters from the sample. 90 meters, I will, for comparison, I can tell you, you please compare it with the 100 meter race dash in an Olympic. So it is that long. So the neutron has to fly through 90 meter path before it reaches the detector. So there are other technical difficulties which I am not discussing at the moment. You have to understand that the neutron, if it travels through air, then it will be highly absorbed in air and then we will lose intensity of neutron. So basically it is traveling through evacuated tubes 90 meters long and then uh, the detected at the high resolution detector bank in HFPD. So, in general, this is like the this is the guide tube which brings the neutron, the thermal neutron, to the sample. You have uh, uh, two sample positions and low angle detector banks, and of course, you have the backscattering detectors in this particular experiment. So now I show you the data from HRPD. The first thing that you can notice is that because the resolution is extremely good, you can see the peaks are extremely narrow. But the other part is that if you see this x-axis, it is despacing. So if I see the intensity as a function of theta in a monochromatic beam, this is intensity, then 2d sin theta is lambda. So as I go to larger and larger theta, sine theta goes up, despacing goes down. So we see peaks are, as I showed you, they, so, so small despacing peaks come at larger theta. On the other hand, if I see the time of flight spectrum, the despacing, you can see the D, as the despacing increases, The formula that I wrote, 2d sin theta equal to lambda, which is h by m l t. So you can see as the despacing increases, the time of flight increases for the given fixed flight path and at a given fixed angle. So here, when we plot as a function of despacing, or as a function of time of flight, in case of uh, spallation neutron sources, the diffraction pattern, it looks like the mirror image of what we see in a diffraction pattern from a reactor source. That's why the same pattern which I showed you earlier, I just want to show you here again. This is the pattern which I showed you from Dhruva. I have kept it as an in inset to this data from HRPD. So this is the time of flight or despacing axis. There you can see that there are mirror image of each other. If I put a mirror in the middle, this and this data, they are reflecting of, reflection of each other. But most importantly here you see lot sharper peaks in case of time of flight spectrum, diffraction spectrum in a pulse source. So but there are, there is a very serious issue which is known as frame overlap problem in time of flight at pulse sources. So this is like this. Now I have started the clock when the proton has hit the target and that is my t equal to zero. After that with all uncertainties regarding moderation and transport, the neutron beam is traveling. Now consider that I have a neutron beam of spectrum with fast and slow. See this is time, this is distance. So 
we know distance is given by velocity into time so it's for smaller velocity it goes slower so it reaches the same distance at a much later time at a later time whereas it reaches a faster time and possibly this is a band of neutrons which have allowed to pass through my choppers so this is the band which i'll be using for my diffraction and i need to measure time of flight but interestingly here you consider the next pulse again i have the same band it goes like this but now imagine this one this one and this one so the slower neutron of the previous pulse is taken over by the faster faster neutron of the next pulse so now this is like uh, you might have seen sometimes that in a race some competitors they are lagging by one full lap and because it's going in circles you don't know whether he is first or he is the last because you see the other competitors uh, going moving with him and it's very difficult so this is known as frame overlap this fact that the slower neutron of the previous pulse are caught up by the faster neutrons of the next pulse so this is what i tried to show you pulse 1 pulse 2 pulse 3 the through the chopper the same range of wavelength passes but if i go to and if i go to very long distances if i go to long distances there's a good chance that the pulses will be overlapping the beam is and the beam is polychromatic in case of uh, uh, pulse neutron sources so for an example uh, consider isis as i told it's a 50 hertz source the time between the pulses is 20 microsecond now a one angstrom neutron is traveling nearly 4000 meters per second if the detector is at 20 meters it reaches the detector at in 5 milliseconds that we can see so a 5 angstrom neutron is 5 times slower so it reaches the same detector in 25 milliseconds then the one angstrom neutron from the next pulse reaches the detector it takes 20 meters it gets a 20 plus 5 milliseconds because it takes 5 milliseconds to reach and it started 20 milliseconds later so it reaches 25 milliseconds so the 5 angstrom neutron of the previous pulse has been caught up by the 1 angstrom neutron of the next pulse and so we can't determine the time of flight if I allow this frame overlap so that's why we not only use polychromatic beams but you also need to use frame overlap choppers that is restrict the wavelength band depending on how far we want to put the detector and that depends on what is the resolution that we are demanding in this experiment.